This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. I'm so happy to be with George Benda. Hi, George. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, of course. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about the state of energy in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And today our title is uh, Clean Energy in 2018, since we just started 2018, and since George is a past master of uh, clean energy. <laughs> uh, George is the CEO of Chelsea Group Limited, and he lives in Molokai, and I always wanted to visit your operation there, but one of these days I will. Good. Uh, I was there what, three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, um, with uh, uh, Fred uh, 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 Fred uh, Riddell, who was the Maui Energy Commissioner. Okay. We, we looked at all the energy facilities in Molokai, and we're making a movie of it. It'll play this Sunday, as a matter of fact, Wonderful. on cable. So, um, so we're here to talk about energy in general, but before we do that, um, George has told me he's been busy. <laughs> He's written not one, not two, but three novels, okay? Most recent one, The River, if you can get that, The River, by George Bender, okay? And then he, that came out in December. I like the, the style of, of, the, of the book. Oh, thank you. Um, the City, okay, uh, and The Edge, and all these are novels. Which, which means we need to find out what the common points are and what kind of novel you're <laughs> writing these days, George. <laughs> well, they're fun. A lot of it is based on my life. Ah. And so uh, these first three are set in, in, uh, in the Chicago area where I grew up. And uh, they're, uh, they're in the 1970s and uh, run through uh, a lot of the things that were happening then, which are surprisingly relevant to today. And in fact, to the topic that we're we're working today, and I'm working on the fourth book right now, which is going to be called The Farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, central to that book is my role in Illinois as the, as the uh, uh, investment officer for the Illinois uh, Energy Bond Fund, which invested in, in demonstrating solar, wind, and, and other wow. technologies in the 1970s. I told you George has been around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 40 plus years of doing this stuff, so. Good, good. Uh, so. Uh, this is, I would call this a series, the the series, because each title begins with the word the. <laughs> it's okay. That, that's it's memorable. Fine. That's fine. It's, if it's the series, that's, that's a great thing to say, because then it's the only one you need to know about. <laughs> it's, only, it's easy to find. Where can I find them? Can I find them on Amazon? Uh, Amazon, yeah. Amazon. That's great. And okay. uh, the city is only in um, uh, e-reader, but the other two are... Were, uh, I was able to publish uh, print on demand, so they're available in print in the in the format that you're seeing here. Oh, okay. I'm going to so do, I'm gonna do that with the city probably shortly. So but. forgive me for this, but I always ask guests who have written books to turn to a page, whatever page you like, and read a paragraph so we can get the smell, the taste uh, of the grease paint and the roar of the crowd, you know? Oh, the goodness. roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd. Yeah, well, I, I, that, that I don't know. I hadn't prepared for this which is really un inexcusable as an author. Uh, but uh, there, is a, uh, there is a page that I think is particularly funny. Um, but why don't I just start at the, the very beginning. Sure. The old rowboat scraped on the rocks, hitting the solid limestone of the moment's ledge. Elmer, get that damn boat all the way to the front of the ledge, Jonah expelled in a deep grumble. The loud whisper carried across the water to the 18 riflemen hiding in the dark under the moon shadow of the old mill. The flat smell of the mill race drifted up with the mist rising off the water wheel. Hold your fire, said Homer, hushed tones. Wait for a clear shot at the dynamite. Late August, 1928, sleepy little town of Moments, Illinois. Water low, exposing the limestone ledge that created a natural dam in the Kankakee River. Nine gun-toting Hoosiers, three in each boat, towing a fourth rowboat full of dynamite, thinking if they blew the ledge, they'd be able to farm right up to the banks of the river, or the ditch, as they preferred to call it in Indiana. You think them suckers knows we here, Jonah? Asked Jonah's cousin, Elmer. Elmer, up to his knees in fast-flowing waters near the ledge, rifle in hand, looking around, worried. Elmer, we done this in secret. Ain't nobody knows we're here, Jonah hissed, not thinking how the sounds carried across the water. The suckers from Illinois smiled up and down their rifle line, each taking a bead on, an, on the invading Hoosier force. Farmers from across the border in Indiana, one and all. Six of the nine Hoosiers were in water. 
waiting to the dynamite, waiting to the dynamite boat wedged against the rocks on the downstream end of the ledge. Rifles down, fighting the current to stay upright on the slippery river bottom. The six men picked up bundles of dynamite to set into the rocks on the ledge. Three rowers kept the little wooden boat steady while the six men struggled to set the charge. Homer, acknowledged leader of the Illinois Riflemen, stood. He moved to the light of the solitary gas lamp at the far end of the mill causeway. You Hoosiers better pack up your things and start rowing upstream, Homer spoke from his gut. Loud, deep, clear enunciation echoed across the divide. We outnumber you, we outgun you, and we got the high ground. If you turn around now, we'll hold our fire. Just leave that dynamite boat where it is. You got my is. attention, George. You know, does this have an audio file that I can buy with the book? No, I'm sorry, not You yet. could make the audio file. You'd be a great voice for it. The original guy, the uh, author himself. Thank you, yeah. thank you. It's a nice compliment. Thank you, Jay. Well, okay, I'm, I'm really uh, in, in, enticed by that. Um, let's let's uh, shift to energy for a minute. Gee, we've had a lot of energy news today. Today, the headline was, and I, we don't need to talk about it, but the, this uh, auditor's report wrote up the um, state energy office. Yes. This is really going to, it's going to have effect. It's going to have effect in the legislature and in the community and the energy industry for sure. Yeah. Well, I just heard the, uh, I just heard the story myself this morning, so I don't know the details of it. I haven't yet read the report. But you know the the goals have been set very um, uh, freehand in a very political way over the years, and uh, the notion of 100% conversion to renewable energy is admirable, but a very 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 high bar, and uh, I think uh, probably not well conceived when when you look at it. Um, and I've dealt with this uh, as a technical matter for years. Uh, um, I also work in indoor environments, and, and one, of, uh, one of the politicians when mold was a big issue in the United States was in a meeting in, in Denver, and, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, he was in the news recently, Con Connors, the, the, uh, the guy who represented Detroit, uh, stood up and his, his senior staff guy had written it as if, it, as if you could control mold like tobacco smoke, and <laughs> that the only acceptable answer for mold was zero tolerance. I'm like, good luck living. <laughs> there, <laughs> That's not so easy. There's so much mold on you right here. now that <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, and it's coming with you. It's not, yeah. not something introduced here. Well, it's the same way when you set these kinds of high bars on technical goals. Yeah. Yeah. You have so many fuel types. You have so many fuel uses. You have so many complex needs in the energy arena. You can convert a very large portion of what we do to electricity, and that's going to be the easiest way to do it. But you're still facing the challenge of things that really require liquid fuels and, and require um, other means of, 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 of developing energy and, and just sheer thermal use that you can yeah. do better ways than, than with uh, photovoltaics. Yeah. So I, I understand why the energy office would be having a difficult time, but uh, you know it is it is it's a difficult place to be. But on the other hand, um, in my years here, I've not been that excited about the work that they've accomplished. Yeah, me so. me neither. And uh, I've never seen an audit report about a government agency this uh, critical. Um, that's why I say there'll there'll be shoes dropping on this one. Yeah. And I don't I don't think that uh, DBED or the state energy office is going to come out whole. Um, this is going to be scandalous, and uh, people are going to be looking at every corner. The report itself, by the way, and I'm talking to our listeners here at this moment, uh, is available online. You can oh, read the report, and it's, uh, it's not as exciting as, uh, as the river, <laughs> the, the novel, but it, it gets close. This is really edgy stuff and worth reading. Well, in, in the 1979 uh, through 83, I was the uh, uh, director of energy programs for the state of Illinois. So I know those shoes, and they are very tough shoes. And at that time, uh, we were in the second oil embargo, that is the second mm -hmm. oil crisis. Uh, we had bomb threats against our building every day. Um, my joke to the guy who ran the fuel allocation program was, you know, we could spare all these bomb threats. We'll just handcuff you to the, the, the uh, parking meters out front and let them with a big sign, this guy runs the allocation program. Uh, not, he didn't think it was that funny, and really I didn't either, but it was you know, one way to lighten the mood. The guys in the energy office are going to feel much the same way right now. They're yeah, going to yeah. feel like people are lobbing hand grenades at them. Yeah, yeah, and some of them will be deserved, by the way. So uh, let's talk about you, Chelsea Group, um, your current iteration in energy. What's it like? 
Well, Chelsea Group really focuses on the infrastructure of existing buildings, and we've been doing that for a very long time. I've been doing that kind of work for 40 years. Uh, much of that is driven by energy conservation, but a lot of it is driven by other issues like indoor air quality, mold, moisture, moisture management, but also fundamental economics of a building. You have a building, it ages, it doesn't maintain its value unless you invest in the infrastructure in that building and keep the building vibrant and, and living. And so we're doing that. Right now we're, um, we're working at uh, Queens Medical Center. We've been there for uh, five years rebuilding the infrastructure in the air handlers and the patient floors and rebuilding uh, big chunks of their central plant. Uh, it's very exciting work as an engineer. It's very gratifying. We're reducing their energy use. By the time we're done, we'll have cut about 20% out of the energy use at Queens Medical just from that these will projects. That's to the benefit not only of Queens, but to the community in general. Exactly. And, you know, my point on all of this stuff, the energy office, I think, uh, doesn't get the point across well enough. And I think it, it's often ignored by those who promote solar and other things. The first thing you have to do is reduce your energy use. And the technologies that have evolved are just fascinating and really outstanding. And so um, we did a project at Pearl Ridge. The upper Pearl Ridge uh, replaced some uh, uh, air conditioning systems, the great big chillers on the roof. 52% uh, reduction in energy use as a result of the change in it's technology. Huge. It's huge. Um, Think of the savings. Exactly. We just did American the, money is fabulous. Yeah, and the the, uh, the central plant at uh, Restaurant Row Waterfront Plaza. Yeah. Uh, we finished that last year, and the documented savings, 19% uh, on their total energy bill, which means that the the plant has, of course, much much more savings than money. that. But, 19% on their total energy bill. Are you are you the only company doing this in Hawaii, or you have competition? Oh, we have competition. Yeah, yeah. I won't tell you who they are. No, we, I we don't, don't need I'm to help anybody notice. out that way. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, but we do we do other kinds of things as well. And um, you know, we've been out at uh, Campbell Square, for example. Um, I think I f my first assignment out there was in 2008, and we've solved water intrusion problems, and and now we're doing something called continuous commissioning and helping them straighten out all their operating systems, got them their LEED certification. And, and so we do a lot, of, a lot of those kinds of things for folks. And well, I say, you know, if you, can, if you can be efficient, save the use of, not use energy, that's the, that's the best saving of all. Absolutely. Um, but on the other side of it, when we come back from this break, George, I'd like to ask you about your views on renewables in the state. Of course. What we need to do to get there, assuming we can get there at all, and, and how we form up decision process and implement that process. I never promised you a rose garden, George. <laughs> we'll be right back after this break. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense. Okay, Think Tech, coming back. I told you we'd come back, and we did come back. And here's George Benda of Chelsea Group. And we're, we're talking about energy in Hawaii. We talked about Chelsea Group for a minute. Now we're going to talk about energy in general and how to get to our renewable goals, however realistic or unrealistic they may be. Right. What do you think, George? Well, I think we can do tremendous things with renewable energy. And, it, you know, the, the example, I can take a very personal example. Over the, over the time that I've lived in Hawaii, we built our house on Molokai. Uh, 2003, we occupied it. We designed it, built it, and at the time, it wasn't cost effective to put in PV. When PV became cost effective, it went in, and now we have an electric car, and we're in the process of, of figuring out how to put in a little more solar because the electric car gets used more than we thought it would. Interesting. And so, here's a, here's a transition. We we have gone from uh, about 70 percent non-renewable to about 90% uh, 
95% renewable uh, in our household. Mm -hmm. um, now, we use the net metering program, which I personally despise. I, I think that net metering was a cancer on our society. In what way? Tell me why. Well, net metering enables the homeowner to realize the full value of the energy that they've generated as if they had purchased it at their doorstep. And that's not really reasonable. Because Without giving credit to the transmission system. Exactly. They're using that transmission system as a battery backup, whether they want to admit to it or not. That's true. They can't do what they're doing without that, without that utility. Yeah. It gets dark. They would be dark. Yeah. The net metering allows the utility to deliver power to yeah. them, and they're, they're netting out on that power that the utility is making. Yeah. Uh, so it has the effect of undermining the finances of the public utility system. Now, I know as an energy uh, person working in energy conservation, this sounds uh, um, like a heretic comment. We need a good utility. We need a solid public utility central system. And I can tell you as someone who even loves the technology, I get darn tired of paying attention to every detail of how my, how my house works. <laughs> what I want is to go back to flip a switch and Forget Seamless, about it. dispatchable, on demand. And the only way that works is with a, a good, reliable central utility, yeah. a good distribution system. Um, but there's no reason that those things need to conflict with a, a strong yeah. renewable future. Yeah. The utility system can be more re renewable. And with electric cars now coming on in a quality and, and reliability that we did not expect to happen this fast, honestly, as an energy professional. I was looking at another couple of decades before we would see things like the Tesla vehicles and the and the vehicle that we drive, which the, is uh, Mercedes. Okay, but the energy I mean, it's electric. It's electric. Yeah, one hundred percent electric. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, Battery yeah, charge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and the uh, it's funny because I priced them all, and the 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 MSR on the Mercedes was like within a hundred bucks of the like, Nissan. I said, oh well, I'm not going. No choice. It's easy. <laughs> It's really easy. I know the net cost of ownership is higher, but that's okay. <laughs> it's worth it. I understand the difference. Um, but the uh, you know the, the electric cars are a huge opportunity for the utilities. But it, this all is being squandered. And I've I've had I've actually had conversations um, with uh, uh, Connie Lau about these things and and explaining that they need to get into the storage. They need to get into the microgrids. They need to be the ones who are controlling that industry. And instead of letting all of these independent little things happen, which is where we're drifting, we need consolidation and the state needs the, the, the gumption to say, okay, we're gonna have a strong grid. We're gonna provide these services. We're going to have distributed energy generation. We're going to have uh, smart microgrids and we have to have at least one utility that, that manages this and can provide the services so that no matter how much of a hobbyist you are, after you put this stuff in, you get tired of it and you just want to flip that switch, the utility is there and can do that. And so that we're serving the entire population, not just relatively wealthy people like me who can afford to buy all these gizmos and gadgets. I agree with you absolutely, totally, yeah. Uh, that's, and that's the key to, to, to moving ahead. Um, it's not only economies of scale, it's economies of management. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but would, you wouldn't rule out uh, distributed energy with solar and battery uh, in a given residence? Oh, absolutely not. And, and I, I, not only do I totally understand, I, I live with both solar PV and battery, and I have thermal PV. Uh, so I... I live with these things. But you need every connection day. also. But, but you need the connection. Yeah. So let's uh, let's skip to um, Molokai for a minute. Um, Molokai, very interesting place, but it runs mostly, or at least more than half, anyway. I couldn't. You you might know the numbers uh, on diesel energy in a yeah, the, in a historic legacy plant with new smokestacks and batteries to smooth out the curve. But nevertheless, it's diesel. Um, how are we doing? What do you see in the future? And where does Half Moon? Half Moon's project fit in, the successor to Princeton. I have a really hard time gauging the seriousness of any of the private sector projects. Um, I met with the Chicago people when they had that project. Uh, could tell immediately they were going nowhere. They didn't understand politics on Molokai. And it's very tough. It's, it's not, not an easy thing at all. 
Uh, the plant manager at the Molokai uh, utility has told me about their commitment to 100% uh, uh, renewable by 2020, and I frankly chuckled. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty the, quick. Yeah, there's just no way. Uh, but on the other hand, it's really not that big of a challenge. I mean, you could, with a few good farm fields and some nice contemporary batteries, you could do it, but it's a big investment. Mm -hmm. Um, my concern is that nobody has the, the gumption to do that. Now, if these guys, uh, with the, you call it the Half Moon Project, uh, let's hope it's not a half-baked project. Uh, <laughs> if, if they want to do it, there's land, there's plenty of sunshine, and the grid is rickety, but it can stand up to it. It's a small enough place. In most universes, it would be considered a microgrid. Uh, but the distribution system is, I would say, easily 50 years out of date. So there's an extra expense there. Yeah, yeah, and nobody's making that investment. And yeah. honestly, when I look at the economics, uh, I don't see how uh, a utility can, can recover their investment on, on Molokai under any circumstance. But, you know, the utility has said that it wants to make Molokai into a kind of laboratory and mm -hmm. learn things about mm -hmm. how to do a small grid that way and use those lessons in other places. And I, you know, I, I admire them for that. I think it's the right approach. And it is a good laboratory, isn't it? It is an outstanding laboratory. And it, you, you have a population that's ready for that kind of experimentation. Um, I I'd probably, I can't think of any place I've been where a larger percentage of the population is willing to uh, suffer a little bit in order to do better things mm -hmm. and, and understands that you don't move forward without some some friction. Um, I grew up around Chicago, uh, as I said, related to the books, and and there there's a, a, a very large, you know, eighty percent of the population. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know about it. They don't want anything to do with it. Just make it work. And on Molokai, everybody's kind of a backyard mechanic. And <laughs> That's true, we'll, we'll, literally. <laughs> well, you kind of have to be. I mean, my, the the guy from Sears comes over. We have our stuff warrantied under Sears. He calls my wife the 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 Sears Molokai repair person. So because <laughs> she he just sends her the parts. He doesn't even bother nice coming style. back anymore. He goes looks and everybody hands her the parts. Does everything. And, yeah, yeah right. and she fixes everything. <laughs> Um, and that's pretty much the way it has well, to be. Well, you know, the thing about Molokai, that, that, I don't know, you're much more familiar with than I, uh, but uh, Molokai is a neighbor island and wants to stay a neighbor island. It doesn't want to be connected very well. Right. Um, it doesn't want cruise ships or fishing boats or a lot of visit, visits from uh, Oahu or anywhere else. Um, and it you know, resists change, uh, although, well, I, my question to you, George, is how do people feel about change? Uh, do they warmly welcome the notion of uh, renewables on Molokai? Will they accept that change? And to what extent um, you know, can we expect them to resist that change? I think you know, change is not a universal. And if you ask me overall, the people of Molokai, willingness to accept change, I, I often describe the, a, a large segment of the Molokai population as, 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 some, uh, as having been stuck at age two, because the only word they know is no. <laughs> but when it comes to renewable energy, that's a difference. Now, are they willing to let somebody come in and rip them off or do something that will destroy uh, the land? Uh, no. They're, 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 then absolutely, they're right back to that. Uh, but are they willing to accept logical change that will stop the flow of foreign oil onto our soil and generation of electricity there? Absolutely. It's part of the environmental credo. Absolutely. It is related to that. So uh, one, one last thing, and then we're going to be out of time, is uh, when we were over there, we spoke to a woman named Amelia Nordhook. She runs something called Sustainable Molokai. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a grassroots organization. Right. A lot of local people in Molokai support that, belong to it. Um, and she is negotiating with, uh, whether it's Half Moon or the utility, I don't know, but she's negotiating with somebody to have a piece of the action. Call it a social hyphen economic hyphen business kind of laboratory in that regard. Right. Uh, she intends to, uh, well, she is asking for a, p a percentage of the ownership and a royalty on their gross. And I wonder how you feel about that. Is that the kind of thing we want to see in the laboratory of our energy evolution? You know, it's, it, that's a very challenging question. As a business person, um, I, I don't like to see those kinds of things. And um, the, uh, on, from a community perspective, I'm very supportive of it, and particularly on Molokai. And Sustainable Aina 
is uh, is a real, really interesting organization, and we we buy much of our produce from them, and we support the farms and so forth. And there's essentially no way for them to be economic. So, from the perspective of this isolated little island and the function of being a laboratory, if people are going to poke at you, you know, when, in, when I was in graduate school, they would pay you to have parts of your body probed and cut off and oh my God. sampled. <laughs> and it's the same thing. I mean, if you're going to screw with us, pay for it. You know, we'll, we'll tolerate it, but you got to give us something back. Sure. And a lot of the fight over the windmills really came down to they want to take all of that energy from the windmills and ship it to Oahu and leave us stuck with, with oil and, and 50 cent a kilowatt hour rates. Come on. Yeah. And so if this changes that equation, great. We should watch Molokai. And we should talk to you again, George. Excellent. We will. My pleasure, Jay. You can run, but you can't hide. We'll find you, George. <laughs> George Bender, <laughs> Chelsea Group from Molokai. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. A pleasure. <laughs>